Welcome to the seminar this week. Our speaker today is Professor Sandra Romain from uh, California Institute for Energy and Environment at UC Berkeley. Uh, just quickly, uh, I would like to remind everyone that our next seminar is in two weeks, November 4th. Uh, the topic will be on demand response and EV charge. Now let's uh, quickly give a brief introduction of our speaker. Uh, Professor Romain is an adjunct professor in the ECS department at UC Berkeley, and she also directs the uh, Electric Grid Research Program at California Institute for Energy and Environment. She's also a faculty scientist at the Berkeley National Lab, and uh, her research focuses on power distribution systems, including applications of mobile sensing, analytics, and control strategies to facilitate the integrations of ER. Uh, she has a, a book. Uh, electric power systems a contact, conceptual introduction. I have read it before, so if you are looking for a book uh, on power system introduction, I will recommend this one. Uh, Sasha received her PhD in energy and resources from this book. So, uh, without further delay, I would uh, let her share the slides. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm going to talk about a labor of love that's called the Oakland Eco Block. It's a very interdisciplinary project, um, a little bit less technical than some of our work um, in electric grid research, but very practical and applied. And I think ultimately it will be very rewarding because we're working with a real community uh, within uh, the city of Oakland to build a very novel uh, type of microgrid. So I will tell you about that. Um, I'm gonna spend a little time with the context and motivation and finish by telling you why all this is improbably difficult to actually pull off. Um, our motivation in the big picture uh, is a set of three challenges that I think all of us here understand. Uh, number one, climate oh. mitigation. Number two, resilience uh, in the face of climate impacts. And number three, equity. Uh, amongst different communities that may be uh, impacted very unequally. So in terms of uh, climate mitigation, we understand that we have to decarbonize uh, the energy sector. And there are essentially three pillars to that. One is energy efficiency. Everything starts with cutting the waste, right? Stop the bleeding first. Uh, number two, renewables and carbon neutral energy, which at the uh, local distribution level generally means solar PV um, as well as uh, small scale uh, energy storage, for the most part batteries, uh, hopefully other technologies like flywheels uh, may uh, become practical and cost effective as well. Uh, very soon. But then the third pillar is electrification, that is shifting end uses over from natural gas and gasoline or diesel to electricity because the electricity is easier to decarbonize than the uh, liquid and gaseous fuels, generally speaking. Um, on the resilience point, uh, really we're talking about survivability and recovery uh, from extreme events. Right, this is a, has always been an issue, but particularly with climate related uh, challenges um, to the electric grid and to other infrastructures, we need to give uh, more thought to that. And finally, making uh, new technology and clean, convenient, healthy solutions affordable for everyone. So that relates to the, uh, to the equity part. I noticed that in your, uh, I think previous quarter, uh, you had Ross Baldick talking about the Texas power outages. Um, and that, you know, obviously had a lot of lessons learned from that event. Also here in California, we had some, uh, some rotating uh, outages. We had some close calls with our California grid. Um, in our case, when the temperatures were hot in Texas, when it was extremely cold, um, and from those close calls, but actually uh, really deadly impact, certainly in Texas, um, 
the death toll that has been reported, depending on whom you ask, is in the hundreds uh, from the power outages last February. Uh, the takeaways were that extreme weather, extreme climate scenarios are real. Um, also that there's an important interdependence between and among infrastructures. In Texas, we saw the interdependence between natural gas production and delivery and the electricity sector. Also the intersection of electricity and water. Um, being out of power is one thing, being out of drinking water, quite another. Um, and the recognition that all of our efforts to make the macro electric grid reliable, um, we must not lose sight of the fact that sooner or later there will be a power outage that may be beyond the control of a utility or a system operator uh, to prevent. It could be a malicious physical or cyber attack, um, or it could be weather scenarios that are simply beyond anyone's capability to prepare for. And so that means we have to save lives, uh, not if, but when the power goes out. I thought that the main lesson learned from Texas was uh, that we need to focus on how to make uh, blackouts survivable for people. Um, yes, it would have been great to have all kinds of measures in place to prevent uh, the power from going out, but the real tragedy was that people died from entirely preventable causes such as not being able to power their medical equipment or simply from hypothermia. Uh, that wasn't necessary. And um, as you probably um, also heard uh, in the case of Texas, what happened is that the distribution utilities simply did not have the tools in place to do intelligent load shedding. Um, certainly at the system operator level, at the ERCOT level, all they could do was tell the distribution utilities, hey, we need you to shed this many more megawatts. But the only way that uh, the utilities could accomplish that was by de-energizing entire distribution circuits, which is when you think about it, a really uh, sort of gross and imprecise way to manage who gets electricity and who doesn't. Because what you want to do is you want to discriminate between the important and the unimportant uses of electricity. Right? Anyone probably would have been happy to volunteer um, their you know, uh, their, even their refrigerator or their air conditioning for the sake of saving someone's life who depended on an oxygen machine. But there was not that ability to prioritize. Um, and uh, one really important strategic change, I believe in smarter grids is to um, be able to uh, prioritize loads more thoughtfully um, and, on smaller scales, both temporally and spatially. So that means uh, sectionalizing distribution circuits. Uh, it means being able to turn individual custom meter, customer meters off so that you can serve some essential loads on a circuit without having to then serve everybody else on that circuit, um, even within the home. Um, there are now uh, technologies like smart uh, circuit breaker panels that allow you to essentially limit uh, the electric consumption within a house um, at the level of the breaker panel so that you can power a few essential circuits and dial it down to um, some specific uh, level of, of the number of watts and be sure that you don't go over that. So this is technology that we understand how to do. We've been loath to implement it in the past, I believe, not just for technical, but also for cultural reasons, because so much of our narrative about the electric grid has been that there is supposed to be ample supply for everyone whenever and wherever you need it. Um, and what we're facing today is the reality that um, uh, providing for those last few nines of reliability costs a lot more than most of us are willing to spend on it. And yet it doesn't have to impact people in a particularly painful way if they are able to uh, prioritize. And it can even go down to the level of individual uh, smart appliances. Um, 
there is a huge opportunity, of course, with technologies that allow you to uh, prioritize loads also to shape your demand at different levels of aggregation that can then be remunerated uh, in markets, whether that is um, at the distribution level, where I think there's a lot of room for emerging new um, uh, mechanisms uh, run by, for instance, distribution system operators. Um, right now, it's mostly at the uh, wholesale or transmission level, but there are also now uh, third-party um, aggregators that will bring, uh, it, that will aggregate smaller amounts of, you know, kilowatt contributions to load shaping into a product that's actually uh, sort of noticeable at the uh, wholesale level. So I think this is uh, an area where hopefully we will see a lot of growth. Um, it's really, there. there is no reason not to take advantage of uh, communication and in, in, uh, information technology that we have today to uh, just be a little bit more proactive uh, in shaping the loads. I just wanted to include a visual here. Uh, this is in your neighborhood across the bay. Um, this is from PG&E's inner uh, connection map. So the city of Palo Alto uh, is not on there, but just to visualize sort of the geography of distribution circuits um, where the pink line uh, that is transmission, the uh, little red triangles are uh, substations from which distribution circuits come. And those are uh, the dark blue ones are older for uh, kilovolt, 4 kV circuits, and then the light blue ones are 12 kV circuits. So the level of granularity that is uh, available today uh, for managing uh, rotating outages, for instance, is, is sort of on the scale of these uh, large clusters. And if there is a hospital or some other critical load somewhere on that circuit, that means all of these customers are exempt from participating in the rotating uh, blackouts. So what that meant for Texas was that, that the rolling blackouts were limited to a very small number of customers uh, who then had their power out for days on end, right? It, th there wasn't the granularity in, in sharing that. Um, but having had this visual, I want to talk about what I think, you know, technically really is sort of the necessary next step, uh, and we have the technology to do this, and that is to enable uh, parts of the grid or sections of the grid to operate as power islands when that is um, apropos, when the main grid is out or when it is uh, not appropriate to try and send power, for example, uh, during a PSPS event, the uh, public safety power shutoff, if, for example, a transmission line um, is impacted by, you know, wildfire hazards, that it's still possible to energize certain pockets of distribution systems if you have enough local generation and load uh, that you can balance. And obviously, the local storage is extremely helpful uh, with that. So. Um, you could call it microgrids. I like calling it balanced clusters without sort of being agnostic to the, um, uh, the regulatory or institutional um, uh, label, like who owns this, under what rules are they managing this. Just from a physical standpoint, what you need is enough kilowatts or megawatts to be balanced in real time to manage frequency and voltage in, uh, you know, on the island. Um, and that can be operated independently, or it can be reconnected to the grid uh, when that is apropos. Now, conventionally, we know of microgrids uh, today, those are owned by uh, essentially one party, right? It would be one customer, one piece of property. Uh, it may be a corporate campus, a university campus, um, a large building, I'm thinking of, you know, hospitals. Uh, there are places that have built microgrids that can be grid connected uh, at some times and islanded at other times that may span multiple buildings. 
But this has really been confined to a single parcel of property or a single owner. And the innovation that we're trying to push with the Oakland Eco Block is that um, the cluster of electrical demand and supply can extend across property lines. It can be a community. It can go across multiple uh, residential properties. And when you start um, to think about what that means to aggregate people together in a community like that, you realize really this is a great opportunity to do a number of things. Uh, so beyond just being an electric power island, um, preparing to um, meet the criteria for that really is an opportunity to start uh, with energy efficiency. In particular, if you're, you know, whether you're doing new construction or retrofitting existing buildings, you want to start by reducing any unnecessary um, energy use. Uh, it's the opportunity to electrify, to switch over from natural gas, um, to anticipate that there will be, I mean, with, in California with our um, EV mandate, there will be a lot of new EVs that will require in many cases upgrading the distribution system. So now is a really good time to think about, uh, you know, future-proofing our distribution systems as we are uh, thinking about adding these new capabilities, accounting for the fact that uh, we will have to have EV charging uh, in addition to, to the existing electrical uh, loads. But this is also a great opportunity uh, to improve indoor air quality, uh, efficiency, better insulation means better health and comfort. Coming back to the survivability, I think many deaths would have been preventable in the case of the te Texas blackout, simply if homes had been better insulated and people wouldn't have to be shivering in the cold um, when there was no electric heating available, right? Because, and conversely in the summer, you know, people in, uh, during power outages die from, from heat stroke and having better thermally performing buildings is really a health and safety issue uh, as much as it's a, a comfort issue. Uh, then there's an opportunity here for uh, community ownership of assets, being able to make investments that an individual household might not be able to make, right? It's easy for us uh, to think about, well, I can get solar on the roof and I can get a Tesla power wall and then my house can operate as uh, its own power island. Not everyone can afford that. Not everyone can qualify for a loan uh, to, to buy that. But uh, what the EcoBlock project is looking at is ways to uh, facilitate that financing and, and providing access uh, to those technologies. And then uh, to make the financial bottom line uh, pencil out, really what we would like to do is also for these balanced clusters or controllable um, microgrids to be able during blue sky conditions to support the grid uh, and perhaps help the utility with problems related to integrating uh, uncontrolled EV chargers, uncontrolled um, solar generation to essentially be a good neighbor because with the microgrid control capability comes the ability uh, to be of service. Uh, but the vision here really is to think about the electric power and energy um, as one piece of a larger picture of greening our cities or uh, making communities more resilient um, and sustainable. And that uh, may cut across many areas. Uh, it incl may include water management, uh, transportation, as I mentioned. It could involve uh, you know, community gardens, food growing, uh, growing, managing microclimates. Um, and a lot of it is about people uh, working together. So the hypothesis we're um, testing in the EcoBlock project um, is that 
there is money to be saved by doing uh, many of these things together. The other part of the hypothesis is really about scale. Um, and it's that uh, doing retrofits in particular um, may be easiest to do not at the individual house level, but at the level of tens of homes where a contractor can swoop in and basically do all the houses on the block, uh, where a you know, section of a distribution circuit can be modified so that it can operate as an island, where you have a number of people that still um, recognize and know each other and can work together in a community. And you get some of that aggregation of the low diversity uh, from among these neighbors to um, sort of make a meaningful uh, contribution to um, you know, shaping the net load uh, on the grid, something on the order of 100 kilowatts or hundreds of kilowatts. Um, and the argument here is that at the individual uh, person or home level, it's sort of too small to make a difference. There's some economies of scale, but then when you scale up to the level of a city, that gets to be more complicated and there's more people involved than can really uh, work with each other uh, individually. There, um, and, and I wanna anticipate sort of the question about how do you retrofit a, uh, a block in a way that can actually pay for itself. Um, and, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but I wanna preempt, um, you know, the question of how can this be profitable to say, we know that there are some public funds that have to be spent on climate resilience and equity. Uh, there's, you know, who knows what will come out of um, the, the spending plans in Washington DC right now that are being negotiated, who knows what's in and what's out of the package, uh, but, Ultimately, there will have to be some amount of public spending on reaching these goals. And really the question is not, can these uh, improvements in um, you know, decarbonization uh, and, and resilience and equity, can these improvements uh, be profitable or be immediately uh, paying for themselves in strictly financial terms? The question really is, where do you get the most bang for the buck? If you're going to be spending public funds, where do you get the best return uh, on that investment? Uh, how can you leverage investments uh, to make communities healthier and safer and decarbonize them um, at the same time? So uh, the hypothesis is that if you are going to be innovating infrastructure, Anyway, and I, I believe that's not going to be a, a choice, it will be an absolute uh, necessity, then maybe we can um, do all these things together most cost effectively. That is to introduce islanding capability at a local uh, level, which then means being able to shed that load on any given day if we need to and have that corner of the distribution circuit be on their own. Um, innovating, uh, beefing up the distribution system so that it can accommodate uh, the solar PV and the EVs that will have to be installed to meet our targets, uh, to basically go beyond what now are the feeder hosting capacity limits for those new loads and that new generation, um, and then ultimately retiring the natural gas infrastructure because to get to zero net carbon, we will have to do that. So again, we can't think of that as you know, something that's going to be profitable. It is an investment that will need to be made in our collective future to uh, really address um, the, the climate problem that we're confronted with uh, inevitably, but asking how can we make these adjustments together in a way that we get the most per dollar spent. Uh, 
So finally here, I'm coming around to the, the title slide for, for the EcoBlock project. It's funded by the California Energy Commission uh, as part of the uh, Electric Program Investment Charge or EPIC uh, program. We are in the middle of phase two, which is to actually build it. Phase one was just to talk about how cool it would be and whether it might be feasible. So there were um, a number of projects in this uh, advanced energy uh, communities program within EPIC, of which four uh, ended up uh, getting funded to actually build their proposed microgrid solution. And uh, the Oakland EcoBlock, again, is focused on doing retrofits using older housing stock with regular folks, not particularly high income on a city block. Um, and I can talk about how we uh, identified the block that we uh, ended up working with. Um, they were, uh, they self-nominated um, and we looked for certain uh, qualities in, in choosing the block um, uh, that that's in the Fruitvale neighborhood of Oakland. Um, so we are building a 100% solar microgrid for roughly uh, 30 some um, uh, electric customers or individual units, including single fam some single family homes, some apartments. Uh, we're developing new uh, legal and financial structures so that this uh, community association um, which now actually is incorporated and they have a board of directors and they will own the assets, which in this case, the California Energy Commission funds are paying for the solar PV and the battery and the microgrid controller uh, and all that. But ultimately the replication model is for that association to get a loan and hopefully a low interest loan uh, that they can uh, together finance uh, and build this. And that is what you know, we hope will bring these options uh, and resilient power into the range uh, where lower income uh, electric customers and neighborhoods can afford it. Um, and our goal eventually is to have a recipe for how the EcoBlock can be replicated elsewhere. I want to call out our two most important partners on this. Uh, one is the city of Oakland um, that has been amazing to work with and is actually putting up uh, a lot of their own staff time and effort uh, to work with us on how does a project like this get permitted? You know, we have to um, do some work on, on the street, uh, on the electrical infrastructure. Um, you know, how does one go about and doing these things efficiently. Um, PG&E has been working with us on the electrical infrastructure um, and our uh, model, our uh, approach for how to um, execute this microgrid in phase two is actually different from what was studied as an option uh, in phase one. Uh, which I'll say a little bit more about, but pg &E has been working with us both on the technical side and on the tariff side, because conventionally there was no such thing as a multi-customer uh, microgrid. So there's a lot of uh, different disciplines that go into this. Um, just, you know, the, the quick overview here, energy, community, urban planning, design and construction, business and finance, legal, water, uh, mobility, and uh, just a few pictures, one of the, the things we're doing on the block. And I will say we're not doing um, as much on, on the water side as we had hoped to do, uh, but it's a start. We're doing energy efficiency and some uh, stormwater management um, on the block. Um, mitigating runoff and essentially beautifying uh, the street a little bit. Um, this particular uh, street is, is up against a creek. And so there's sort of a nice integration that we hope to do. We, are, uh, we have done energy and water audits in the participating homes and are uh, planning to go in and do the actual physical construction work starting early next year. All of this was delayed a bit by COVID, but we're persevering and trucking along. 
Um, so for the microgrid design, the original vision was to have DC coupled uh, solar PV and batteries all interconnected with a DC um, infrastructure that was going to be separately um, owned by the association and separate from PG&E. And our regulatory argument, which we'll come back to, is that this should qualify under the own use provision of uh, California Public Utilities Code, Section 218, uh, that says, well, you can't sell power across uh, a property line. Um, and, or if you do, you have to become a regulated utility and you'd be competing with PG&E here. Um, so our, now our interpretation is that a homeowners association, for example, should be able to do that because it's a nonprofit and it's for the shared use of the uh, participants. However, that is a longer um, legal regulatory argument and uh, which, which we haven't won yet. Uh, but meanwhile, PG&E is actually very interested in exploring uh, microgrid options because their thinking has evolved a lot since we've had these horrendous wildfire seasons. They've had to do their PSPS. Uh, and they're also looking at areas where they're serving customers that they might prefer to serve in a standalone microgrid um, way than to have to keep lines energized that run through um, you know, high hazard fire areas through the forest for many miles. Um, so PG&E is actually very keen to experiment uh, with different types of microgrids. And in this case, uh, we are under their community microgrid uh, enablement tariff that will um, be sort of the, the regulatory umbrella under which the EcoBlock becomes legal. Uh, to, um, to function as an entity, to basically allow the EcoBlock to operate as an island, uh, although PG&E distribution operators will have control over the connect-disconnect switch. Um, but the assets, uh, including generation uh, and storage and microgrid controller will be operated and controlled by the association, or that is a contractor, um, HALA Technologies uh, will be doing the actual physical uh, operation and management of it, but PG&E continues to own the distribution wires and transformers, um, which means that PG&E still uh, you know, has the liability and the responsibility to come fix something if it uh, gets damaged and so forth. And, and the insurance is actually a sticky point. Um, carrying liability insurance for power distribution equipment um, is a very expensive thing that could easily be prohibitive uh, for uh, a community like this. Um, so, you know, here's a view of the block and we don't want to advertise the exact location really to protect the privacy of the participants for the time being. Um, so I'm not advertising the name of the street. It is in the Fruitvale neighborhood. And, um, you know, as you can sort of get the feel for it, it's the older homes you don't see on this picture, uh, an apartment building and a small commercial uh, a corner store. Um, so the microgrid physically will combine um, rooftop solar, essentially as many kilowatts as will fit on every roof. And um, those assets are shared and every solar array just uh, contributes as much as it can into, um, into that uh, distribution circuit. Uh, there will be some smaller batteries at the home level and one larger community scale battery on the 100 kilowatt scale uh, with a grid forming inverter. That's sort of the main um, resource that will have the ability to black start that uh, microgrid. I already mentioned we start with uh, efficiency retrofits and uh, the intelligent control is a huge part, right? Because in order to save some money on the sizing of these assets and to be confident in knowing that this microgrid could really operate indefinitely, 
uh, even in the winter, we need the ability to prioritize loads and to shut stuff off that's not essential, depending on how long we think we're going to be out of power, what's the state of charge of the batteries, uh, how much sun do we have right now. There needs to be an intelligent process for prioritizing that at the individual house level and at the block level. So the microgrid controller uh, will be able to do that. Now, electrical engineering is easy compared to uh, the, the challenge of governance, right? Seven different languages are spoken on the block. Um, there are a lot of different expectations and uh, views of how people should work together, um, how you know, the, the community should be relating to the utility company, how the participants should relate to each other their financial stakes and ultimately it's the property owners who are becoming uh, part of the association um, who are putting a, a piece of their property value on on the line right with with their commitment um, and that's a big ask uh, that's a lot of trust that we're asking for and really the participants have to trust uh, each other there's uh, obviously protections uh, built into the bylaws of the association and into um, the, the contract that or the agreement that each participant ultimately signs um, that you know nobody can really get screwed over but there has to be um, really the the bottom line of trust that that people are doing this uh, in good faith because it hasn't been done before like this. We're hoping that with the fifth or 10th or 100th eco block, it will be much easier to point to the previous examples and say, well, you know, we're organizing ourselves like this other block has done. And here's the blueprint for, uh, for the government uh, governance process. But uh, really our, a key goal in our research project has been to uh, really cultivate transparency and uh, make sure that everybody understands uh, what's happening, including the things that we as researchers don't know yet. Um, I mentioned uh, the PUC section 218, right? Um, we believe that, uh, and Dan Kamen and I uh, authored a white paper that was shared with the uh, Public Utilities Commission, we believe that the own use exemption should apply to cases like this. It should be uh, permissible for uh, a neighbor to share power with their neighbor, uh, for example, to site a battery on one property uh, that's being charged with PV uh, from across the fence. Um, there is a, um, a working group that is looking at uh, these issues also, you know, the, the tariff question, how do you design uh, the rules and the rates uh, to ensure that there isn't any unfair sort of cross subsidization among different uh, utility customer uh, types or customer classes. Uh, but to make this, this type of resilience accessible uh, to all. So, um, I think that another huge challenge here is really working uh, with existing homes and an existing community of people that just happen to live on the same street, as opposed to starting from scratch with some intentional community or new development where, yeah, you know, we can build a new um, green sustainable neighborhood and attract the kinds of people who want to live there and work together as a community that would be an entirely different um, thing to do than to just you know, grab these 33 households and say, okay, uh, we're now going to work together and you'll get to know each other and we'll translate where we have to translate where people don't speak each other's language. Um, but we're going to make this effort because ultimately, and I do think this is ultimately in human nature to want to uh, support each other, especially when there is a kind of physical emergency uh, that we're all facing in the same way. 
I have this personal memory of um, really getting to know my neighbors in San Francisco after the Loma Prieta earthquake uh, in 1989. Uh, where, you know, it suddenly became very clear that, hey, we're here to help each other and make sure everyone is okay. Um, I have also a personal experience with a group of neighbors uh, in the High Sierra, uh, where we have, uh, you know, shared water resources. And lo and behold, people from different political parties and people with very different cultural backgrounds can come together and work together uh, with the understanding that uh, we all need drinking water and we all want each other to have that and to be safe. Uh, so I'm actually very optimistic that we can challenge everything that's good in human nature, uh, that we can channel that to uh, work cooperatively to deal with uh, extreme weather events and emergency kinds of scenarios, but we have to facilitate that process and create an infrastructure uh, that's set up for that, that allows people to help each other. Uh, so right now we are, uh, as I said, in the middle of phase two, which is to build the project. Um, we're designing everything to be specific to uh, the site, but also keeping notes, uh, keeping close track of what decisions we made and why, and how it, for a different block, for example, in a different climate zone with different building stock, um, with different solar resource, in, uh, on a different distribution circuit, uh, under different circumstances might have opted for different solutions at different points along the way. So that will be our eco block handbook. Um, and then we hope to scale this up uh, to have a recipe book for how to adapt this to other blocks um, and make be able ultimately to make a business case that's good enough um, for at least in a nonprofit way and perhaps with some uh, public funding to go into this, hopefully ultimate, ultimately to have a positive cash flow uh, for projects like this to find a way to make this pencil out. Um, and uh, we think there is absolutely, uh, the value proposition is absolutely there. There's some work that has to happen in the re regulatory framework um, to, to facilitate this. And you know things like the cost of insurance uh, which reminds me of, you know, the, the analogy I, I uh, think about is trying to get liability insurance for an indoor rock climbing gym, which for the first climbing gym was really hard to do because, you know, the insurance companies thought, oh my goodness, indoor rock climbing, that sounds terribly dangerous. People are going to die. People are going to get hurt. We're going to charge you a huge premium. And now, of course, there's an entire industry for this, and it's a standard product, right? And there's standard safety procedures that are agreed upon in the field. And I believe that multi-customer microgrids uh, will evolve in that same way, that clearly there are hazards, there's intrinsic hazards um, and risks that have to be managed, but there will be standardized procedures and it will become a standard sort of insurance product, like sure, will you know will ensure your community microgrid and there will be a standard uh financial product as a standard type of loan um to uh to take out for that so, and, and you know the reason i've chosen this uh graphic uh, here which you know illustrates blocks uh of of buildings is because the block is really a unit that's replicated all across the country and all across the world so if we have a cookie cutter solution um, that can work for a block it could be replicated very quickly uh, in many places still this is hard as i said it requires uh, trust it requires cooperation amongst uh, many parties including the technology developers the electric utility, um, trust between the property owners and the renters and things as simple as, you know, who saves money on their electric bill when the solar is producing? Uh, 
Um, and how does that get reflected in the dues payment for the community association? Uh, will the landlord raise the rent for the tenant um, or you know, should they be allowed to do that? How are the savings allocated amongst the participants? Um, it requires uh, really operating in good faith and with some, um, uh, some ground rules in place. Uh, requires cooperation with local government, uh, with the city, uh, permitting, and uh, the regulatory agencies. So um, as I said in the beginning, it's a labor of love. It's a huge team working on this. Um, and I think all of us are inspired by what this might uh, be able to do really to um, accelerate our whole, our states, our countries and the world's uh, movement in the direction uh, toward climate uh, mitigation, also unfortunately climate adaptation uh, and resilience um, as well as equity. So I will um, stop here for Q and A. Any questions? Uh, thank you first all uh, to share this cool project. And my question is, have we done projections on whether um, this pilot program would result in overall savings to PG&E, so bring benefits to other non-participating customers, or is it gonna incur like more expenses, so there would be some cost shifting to other customers? A great question. So, um, you know, PG&E is very sensitive to the cost shifting issue. And I think I can say uh, that there will absolutely not be any cost shifting uh, to other customers to pay for all of this fund. Um, in particular, because um, for this project, um, and we, we haven't penciled out the details of you know, how much uh, some of the upgrades, for instance, we need to do uh, a transformer upgrade um, and a new transformer and how much that's gonna cost um, and some changes to the, uh, what is now a single phase um, distribution lateral that uh, for some stretch of it will have to be upgraded to three phase. That will cost some money. Um, and in this case, the project uh, will pay for the bulk of that. Um, in the long run, uh, and for scalability, I think those types of upgrades have to be rate-based in the sense that they're inevitable anyway, right? Because when there, are, uh, when there are upgrades for load growth, those are generally speaking rate-based. That is, all the customers pay a share to, um, to allow for, uh, for these upgrades. And what we're looking at in the big picture is that electricity may need to be more expensive than it already is, right? In order to reach our goals. Now, in the to reach our climate goals and our solar and EV integration goals, there will have to be some, uh, some upgrades done that cost money. Uh, at the societal level, I believe that investment is absolutely worth it because the alternative is much more expensive, right? We can't afford not to make those investments in our electric infrastructure. Uh, but how you allocate it sort of between, um, between microgrids and other customers, um, you know, it stands to reason that those customers who benefit from increased reliability and res resilience have some, uh, should have some burden to pay more for that privilege, right? Um, and yet, on the other side, you can argue that, well, wait a minute, the utility has an obligation to serve. So if this is what it takes to serve reliably, reliably some group of customers, for example, if because of the you know, wildfire hazard uh, conditions, 
Uh, if, it's, if a microgrid is the most realistic way to serve that load, then the utility has to uh, take that route and pay for it. So uh, I think um, that's very fertile ground for um, you know, detailed uh, conversations. And I'm looking at what's on the shared screen. Yeah, to... There are two questions in the Q and A. Say again. Do you, you see the questions? I... Um, yes. Yeah, so, I would it help the economics to have block-based rate making for electricity and gas to encourage the local solution? We currently have peanut butter rate making. Love that. Um, um, I don't know. And, uh, you know, I, whenever I have the opportunity, uh, focus on electrons rather than dollars, because I find the electrons a lot easier to understand. And I think that there are people much more qualified than me to talk about rate design uh, and, and tariff design uh, to find the best solution. I come at it really from uh, the perspective of the societal level uh, and you know what is collectively the least cost way of making sure people are safe, period. And um, I think that, I, so my hunch is that there are actually some savings that can be had at the utility or system operator level, uh, which I didn't mention previously. And that is that if we can guarantee that people will be safe and healthy when the macro grid goes out. That means potentially saving billions and billions of dollars that we now spend on the last nines of reliability. This is politically a very difficult point to discuss because nobody wants to be the person who sticks their neck out and goes on camera and says, yeah, the grid should become less reliable, right? Even though it makes sense, it might make sense from the societal point of view to say, as long as we make sure that the most vulnerable people are taken care of and that nobody will get hurt or will die when the macro grid goes out, wow, we can save a whole lot that we're now spending on uh, you know, generation reserves, for example. And uh, or or certain other system upgrades that we wouldn't need if we can actually depend on the local, more granular management uh, of load in, in in both time and space. So um, so I think there are savings there to be realized, and people who are better steeped in uh, in the economics should should take this up and discuss it. Um, how will this affect existing utility companies' facilities? How will the existing power plants be paid for? Um, so the electric supply costs are really, I think, a separate, quite separate bucket from the distribution uh, charges, right? I mean, it, it's itemized on our bills. And um, I, uh, but I, it's a great question because it actually reminds me to say something that I neglected to say earlier. That is, I think there, there are potential savings that is distribution system benefits that can be realized from uh, controllable loads and controllable clusters or microgrids for which there is not presently a tariff. Um, and you know we've talked about this with PG&E and they're very collegial in talking these things through with us, but uh, the reality is there isn't really a mechanism to uh, capture and you know both validate and remunerate uh, things like voltage services at the distribution level or being able to alleviate local overloads, basically um, helping um, defer or avoid uh, other distribution uh, system investments. I'm convinced that that value is there somewhere. There's not a mechanism to capture it. Um, now, and as far as on the generation side, a microgrid that can be intermittently connected clearly is taking advantage of the rest of the grid as a battery and as a reliability resource should pay for that. 
right? Um, it, it shouldn't just pay zero if it has the benefit of connecting to the grid. And I see this is coming back to the uh, um, other generation uh, to the electric supply costs, which of course are mostly owned not by the utilities, but by uh, other uh, generating resources. Um, you know, th there will be a demand for those resources because by the kilowatt hour or by the megawatt hour, those will still be less expensive. That's where I really see a complementary uh, approach between having the local uh, distributed renewables and having the larger scale centralized solar and wind farms that can really produce megawatt hours less expensively because you can site them in the best, you know, uh, the best regions, but which happens to be not where people live because it's either too hot and sunny or too damn windy to live there. Um, so uh, I think that this sort of approach to do local generation to meet essential needs and then do the less expensive bulk energy production uh, in a centralized or more remote way, basically thinking of that as the, you know, the benefit of accessing cheap bulk resources, but also uh, using that in, in the sense as a luxury to, to supply the convenience loads. Uh, that's what we're sizing the system for, but we may not want to have to count on the network uh, to be there, you know, without fail. Uh, for us. I don't know if that answered the question, but I'm going to go on to the next one. How are drought problems such as inadequate water supply for water utility use, um, farming and water reservoir maintenance? Um, water and electricity are resources should be included in the rates. How can they be separated? I'm not quite sure I understand um, the question. I mean, there's there's a couple of different intersections between water and electricity. Um, you know, on the one hand, we use hydropower to produce electricity. Um, so, uh, and that might be referred to here. That is, uh, we've. I mean, last year has been a terrible um, year for for hydro resource, right? A lot of the reservoirs are at historic lows and thank goodness it's raining right now. Uh, fingers crossed for a better season, but so that impacts uh, electricity scarcity. And on the other hand, we also need electricity to pump drinking water, also to pump sewage by the way. So water inflow and outflow is you know, absolutely dependent on having some amount um, of electricity. But the pricing, um, you know, in my mind, uh, those are quite separate. And I'm not sure, maybe somebody else wants to help uh, discuss this question. Uh, just to hit the last point on this um, uh, screen desalination. Um, is necessary to discuss. Uh, certainly desalination is one uh, type of electricity use that I think is easy to shape around the availability um, of solar or wind power. So it's a kind of load that you know, doesn't have to run um, uninterrupted at a certain power level, but could be helped to uh, basically flatten the overall demand profile. Um, how did we present this complicated info to the community? Ha, multiple outreach sessions. Yes, indeed. Uh, so we started with hiring a professional uh, community outreach coordinator um, who is a, an Oakland native and basically her job uh, is to know everyone and talk to everyone both in city hall and on the blocks in the neighborhood. Um, and then we've had a number of sessions, some you know, outdoors masked during COVID um, out on the street with posters and um, yeah, little pieces at a time. 
I think this would have been easier if we as researchers could have gone in from the beginning and known exactly what we're doing. But we've had to go in and, and say to people, okay, we're gonna do this project together. Um, that is, we hope you'll do this project with us. We can't force you to, even after you've signed a letter that says you know, you're interested. Um, we don't know yet exactly what we're doing, but we're figuring it out with you. Um, and that gives the participants the opportunity to shape uh, the process. Certainly the, um, you know, the, the board of directors for the community association, um, just a, a group of folks on the block has taken the lead in self-organizing. And as researchers, we now sort of sit and listen in, but we're not driving that process. Right, and they're actually taking it to the next uh, level of communicating with their neighbors. Um, but we also, we have a, a monthly newsletter. Uh, so we have a website that's public facing, ecoblock.berkeley.edu. And we have a part of that website that's accessible to the participants only. Um, and so that involves a lot of technical explanation. And you know, sometimes talking about stuff more than once, and sometimes going back and saying, oops, we're sorry, we said something wrong, here it is corrected because we just figured this out. Um, so thank you. Um, can I elaborate further on the EV charging? Um, right, so um, the details of the pricing are not yet worked out. The basic approach is that there uh, will be one or two vehicles um, that will be um, accessible to the participants to borrow and then come back and charge uh, from the microgrid. Um, the goal is that this will allow people to, some of the households to get rid of their second car. What we've learned, and these are things that you learn when you actually do a project on the ground, is that the super hard currency on the block is parking spaces. And we, you will like incite a mini war amongst neighbors if you start to take away parking spaces. So actually the toughest issue on the EV front isn't the pricing, isn't the load shaping or the duck curve. It's the question of, well, do you dedicate a parking space to the EV? And how do you tell everybody else that there's now one less spot for uh, parking any other car? Um, we have looked at vehicle to grid, two-way charging, probably too complicated for uh, what we're, we're doing here. It's a possible resource. I think that would be the way to go if there were a larger number uh, of EVs. And that's, I think, one of those uh, topics that we're like, well, let's do it next time. Um, let's scroll down. I don't know if that was- I all. think that, that's the last question. That's the Great. Last question. Okay. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. That was really awesome. Thank you.